thank you guys all for coming. This is our ME520 seminar for mechanical engineering. Uh, this is the first talk of four talks that we have lined up as a mini symposium about mechanical engineering in space. Uh, I'm Professor Nate Snyadecki. I'm a faculty in mechanical engineering. And I'd like to introduce you guys to Tai Higashi, who is a PhD student here in mechanical engineering as well. Um, Tai is doing his PhD work with myself down in uh, South Lake Union at the UW Medicine's uh, camp research campus down there. Uh, Ty, as you'll see in our talk, is a, a co-inventor on one of the magnetic technologies that are in this talk. Um, but before coming to UW, Ty received his uh, bachelor's in engineering from Fort Lewis College, which is one of six Native American serving uh, non-tribal colleges in the country. Um, he's a recipient of our uh, Graduate Opportunities and Minority Achievement Program, the GOMAP Presidential Fellowship, and was also awarded the NSF's Graduate Research Fellowship last year, but declined it. Um, so I'll go ahead and this talk is being recorded, um, so that way we can broadcast it onto uh, the Mechanical Engineering's YouTube channel later on. Um, but I, we will have uh, our presentation and also there'll be a Q and A afterwards. So if you guys have questions, feel free to, to write them into the chat or also hold, uh, hold tight until um, we're all set with, all done with our talk. Um, but without further ado, um, I'll, I'll get started. So these are our disclosures. So the heart, is a very interesting muscle. And there's a lot of biomechanics to it um, throughout the years. I think if you even go back to Leonardo da Vinci's days, he did a lot of um, hypothesis and, and drawings of the heart. But if you were to unwrap the heart, you'll find that it's a continuous band of muscle. There's actually um, some very interesting dissections where you're able to unwrap the heart and basically bring it out as a large singular muscle strip with a slight, with a single twist into it. And so it has this helical pattern to it. You can kind of make out these muscle fibers as they wrap around each other. So on the outer surface of the heart, the muscle fibers might be oriented one way, but deeper inside, they're oriented in a different direction. And that's really interesting for how the heart works it actually doesn't pump out blood like you would squeeze your hands together because there's no way for, your, the, for the fingers of the heart to pass over each other. What it actually does is it has a twisting motion, almost like you're wringing out a towel. This is a way of allowing the heart to, to shrink its inner chambers, um, but, with, you know, but still having um, the muscle contract. And so the heart is a very dynamic pump. It has to modulate its volume. You know, you want to have a consistent amount of blood flowing through the rest of your body, but your flow rate will increase, your heartbeat will increase, and the different um, demands on your body will change. And so the heart has to adjust to these different flow dynamics. So one of them is increased stretch. And this happens when you start to exercise. Your blood starts to flow faster and you start to get more volume returning into the chambers of the heart. Well, that will cause the heart to, to stretch. And this is, happens during the part where it's not contracting. This is the, the diastole or the diastolic pressure. Well, this is called preload. And the heart will now have to then contract even further to get that volume back out again. If it's been expanded, it has to now contract further to release that volume. The other one is changes in blood pressure. If let's say, for example, you have hypertension, your blood pressure has risen, this is what we call afterload. And the heart has to work harder to overcome that pressure so that way it can eject out its volume into the rest of your body. So the heart is dynamic and it has this ability to adjust itself. But things are different. 
Um, you know, we've spent all our lives on Earth, but on space, without the effect of gravity, things are a little different. So there are some emerging concerns about the heart in space. Um, mostly this is from a lack of gravity. Um, the astronauts are floating around and you don't have that hydric, the hydrostatic pressure that keeps the blood mostly in your legs. You have a lot of blood volume in your legs. And so if you've ever seen uh, pictures of, of people up in space, they tend to have um, puffier faces. And it's really because the blood now has an even pressure throughout. And so a lot of the blood volume that was normally being held down in the legs has now floated up to the face. Um, this is also similar to being um, sort of in bed rest, you know, if you're laying horizontal, it's sort of a similar effect. And as a consequence, there's a lot of muscle loss that can occur, this cardiac atrophy that can occur during spaceflight. Um, and so there's been a lot of space research about trying to replicate this process by having people um, lay down in bed, but it's, it's not the same as um, um, actually being up in space. So to, to better understand this and find ways to, to um, address this loss of, of heart muscle, you'd ultimately, ultimately want to do human studies, but that's really hard in space. You know, we can only send a few people up at a time. And so to do a real decent job of, of trying to understand this, this change in biology, you, you know, you ultimately would like to be able to do human studies in space, especially as we're trying to figure out ways to fly further or have more and more people living up in this low gravity environment. So there needs to be a better way to understand what happens to the heart in microgravity. And that's actually what the topic of this talk is about, is a project that Ty and I have been working on over the last two years in collaboration with several other uh, universities to study the effect of microgravity on something that is, is a, uh, a surrogate for the human heart. And this is what we call these engineered heart tissues. These are um, human built uh, heart tissue made from stem cells that allows us to study the effect of microgravity on the heart tissue itself. So we'll talk more about the study in space and actually Ty will talk more about the actual work that, that went into this, but I'm gonna talk a little bit now about these engineered heart tissues. So these are made from stem cells here at the University of Washington that we can convert them into becoming heart muscle, which is what a cardiomyocyte is. And so what you see here are these little heart strings suspended between these two silicone pillars. And within that string, it provides a three-dimensional environment for these cells. So these um, heart muscle cells will elongate in the direction of that uh, tissue, and they'll develop a very strong, very mature um, structure on the inside that is reminiscent of what you would see in real cardiac heart tissue. Now, we can measure how strong these tissues are by how far they bend these pillars. So this is a simple cantilever system. These silicone pillars are flexible, and based upon how much deflection we see, we know how much force there is. And this is just given by this simple beam bending equation here. Now you'll notice that these silicone pillars have these little red cubes within them. These are neodymium magnets and they have a special purpose as well that we'll talk about later. So how do we make these? Well, to make those silicone pillars, we just use a casting process. So we have a, an acrylic mold that has four parts to it. Um, the walls, the middle part, and the bottom. And we can pour our, our silicone rubber into that and cook it to, 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 to cure that polymer into a rigid, flexible silicone rubber. And then we can release that. And then to make the tissues, we use another mold. This time it's non-adhesive. This is an agarose mold. And so this is a simple rectangular trench that we can squirt into this, a solution of half a million heart muscle cells um, 
about 10% of it being these uh, stromal cells that help pull the tissue together, and the rest of it being a fibrin hydrogel. So these are all biological materials. And once the, you cast these, these cells in this gel, it begins to, to set, it becomes a solid. And the cells will start to contract and find each other and pull together to assemble this connected tissue that begins to contract within an hour or two of the casting process. And once we've had these tissues, you can grow them in the lab for weeks to months at a time, as long as you keep changing the, the food, the, the growth media for these cells. So this is what they look like in the lab. Um, we have here 12 wells of a 24 well dish. And you can see, this is a bottom view of it, but these are the tissues here that are suspended between the two pillars. One of these pillars is rigid. We have a, a glass rod inside. The other one is flexible and has that, that small magnet inside. And these things are living. So if you actually watch these under your own eyes, you can see as these tissues contract spontaneously. And so each one is beating to its own heartbeat, if you will. And we're able to monitor how much force they're generating by how far they are moving that flexible pillar. So why, the way to use these is to look at diseases. So by using stem cells that you obtain from an, a patient who may have a genetic disease, you can create heart tissue from those cells and then have a disease in a dish study. So for example, someone who might have a genetic disease, you can take a skin biopsy from them or you can collect cells from their urine and then you can turn them back into becoming like a, a stem cell. This is what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. This is by turning on four transcription factors, you can convert this adult cell back into becoming a stem cell. And then you can differentiate it, you can convert it into becoming heart muscle. And once you have that, the idea is now that you have this heart tissue to work with, because there's not really many spare hearts around to study. So this is one way of having this um, uh, almost endless supply of, of cardiac tissue to study diseases in the dish because it has all of the same genetic um, problems or genetic differences that you have in the original patient. And so you can start to find the, the features of this, of these heart tissue, and perhaps even set it up for high throughput screening where you can try different candidate drugs that might correct for any of these mutations that are causing this disease. So in what particular, uh, we have a collaboration with David Mack uh, at Utah Medicine looking at Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So this is a muscle wasting disease because, that's caused because these individuals lack a protein. They're not producing dystrophin, which is normally there to help protect the muscle, but without this protein, the muscle begins to waste away. And so you have a loss of muscle tissue. And that affects not only the skeletal muscle, but it also affects the cardiac muscle. So these individuals, unfortunately, have shorter lives because they develop skeletal problems, but that can be somewhat addressed. But it's the cardiac problems that these individuals have that really shorten their lifespan. And so we can take cells from these patients, turn them into stem cells, and then turn them into heart tissue that we make between these two pillars. And we can see that these, by comparing one that might represent the, the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, this DMD, we see that it has a much lower amount of, of the dystrophin protein, but you know, we see that they are able to form tissues, but the tissues are not as well organized. They don't have as much of that contractile machinery as you would see in the control or the wild type condition. So using our engineered heart tissues, we've actually been able to recreate this, this weaker muscle uh, phenotype that is caused by this disease. So we have over here, um, you know, well, there is, we have over here the, the, the amount of force that's being generated with each of these little heartbeats of these tissues. 
So normally under control conditions, it generates a lot of force and then begins to relax with each beat. But with the, the DMD mutant line, we see that the forces are much weaker and they also have a slightly lower amount of baseline force. So that, that sort of feature is being shown here with a difference in a weaker twitch force within these tissues. We, if you look about the, the, the overall area, the cross-sectional area, we see a, a lower amount of, of um, um, uh, stress being generated by these tissues. And so let me get this one out of my way for a second. Um, the amount of power, which is a combination of both their velocity and their force that they're generating is also weaker here, as is how much work that these tissues are generating. Now, if you actually normalize everything by how much force they generate, you also start to see some kinetic differences. Um, you can notice here that the DMD mutant line is slower. It doesn't get up to its maximum force as fast as the control. And so that upstroke velocity is lower. The time to peak is longer. But on the relaxation side, it's mostly equivalent. There's, there is a slight difference in how long it takes for these tissues to relax. But eventually, by the time they get to almost full relaxation, they're pretty much equivalent. So this is just one example of, of sort of studying disease in a dish. Um, the other one, too, is trying to now study some of the more biomechanics or uh, how actually the exercise or, or load could affect these tissues. So after load, again, is that pressure that the heart has to work against to eject its volume. And so this is maybe something that may help mature these, these stem cell derived cardiomyocytes because they're not the same as adult tissue. They don't have as much force. Um, they don't have as much contractile machinery as the adult heart muscle does. And so we're looking at ways to mature them, to make them larger, to make them stronger, to be more representative of adult tissue. And one cue that we think is, is a very potent one is blood pressure. So if you think about an, um, a, a developing human, in utero, the blood pressure may be around 30 millimeters of mercury within the first 10 weeks, but near the final term, you know, before uh, birth, that blood pressure almost doubles. And so this cue of, of load could be something that may help mature these tissues. And so to, to study this, we just stiffened the, the pillars. We use these 3D printed braces that we can clip on and that would effectively shorten the length of these pillars. And so now this tall pillar set over here is long and slender and very flexible. While over here with this K4 condition, this is almost isometric. You're almost not allowing these tissues to contract much at all. So we have over here just about two orders of magnitude difference between the stiffness of these pillars as a way to create that afterload effect. So what we found here is that by increasing that stiffness, these pillars don't deflect as much. So going from the softest to the most stiff, we almost have a pure isometric state, but the force that these tissues is increased, is, um, they produce is increasing. So as we go up in the stiffness, we're starting to see that these tissues generate more force against that increased resistance. And of course, their velocity begins to slow down as you've increased this resistance. But there is a sweet spot for power. It's actually not the stiffest environment, but that K3 shown here in red that gives us the most power that's produced by these tissues. The rest of the graphs here pretty much summarize what I'm kind of showing you above here in the top. So how is that possible? How are these tissues able to become stronger on these different environments? Well, since we have those tissues, we can do a bunch of, of, of transcriptomic analysis. We can look to see what proteins are being produced within these cells that would give us an indication for why they are being stronger with these different load conditions. So this is a bunch of qPCR data and for those of you guys, I think that what I want to highlight is, a, is that 
as tissue matures, we expect that myosin, or MYH6, this is a gene for um, alpha myosin, we expect it to go down as a tissue matures. And we also expect beta myosin, which is the gene MYH7, to go up. And so we're seeing this change based upon the stiffness. And this is just with you know, what kind of RNA is present. You can actually look at the protein levels and we do see that on that stiffest environment, we're seeing a decrease in alpha myosin like we expect, but it's nowhere near actual fetal tissue. So it still needs improvement. But we also start to see an increase in the beta myosin levels too. But again, it's not yet equivalent to that fetal tissue, but it is an improvement over what, you know, how these cells were, in, um, what they were like on day one in the tissue culture dish. And so ultimately you look at this ratio between um, alpha myosin and beta myosin. And here you see that it increases with the different afterloads that we apply. So this is sort of two little stories about disease modeling and looking at the, the cell mechanics or the mechanobiology of these tissues. But this just kind of lays the groundwork for our, our space project, because this was a two year effort uh, with the University of Washington, BioServe in Colorado, uh, Johns Hopkins University, and the um, Ohio State, or you know, now at, uh, um, uh, Peter Lee, who's now at Brown University. So what we are trying to do is take our engineered heart tissues in this portable housing unit, and we're trying to ship it up on the SpaceX uh, Rocket 20, uh, CRS-20, to the International Space Station for a four-month, four-week study uh, on the International Space Station to look at the effects of microgravity. So I'm going to pass it over to Ty now. Um, Ty, you, I'm going to give you remote control here. There you go. Okay, um, um, you guys, can, everyone can hear me all right? Just checking, okay. And uh, yeah, so going on to the, 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 the uh, experiment on the International Space Station with our engineered heart tissue platform, I will see if I can. Good. For some reason, oh, okay. So yeah. One of the like, uh, big concerns with sending any sort of uh, experiment, let it be uh, like a, in our case, bio and biological experiment up to space is that a lot of things change from, from Earth, you know, <laughs> between Earth and space, obviously. And I think one of the key like, uh, like uh, mantras that I had in my head was at the beginning of like when I just start, when I got onboarded onto this project, we talked with Professor Ed Kelly at UW from the pharmacy school and he had sent projects up to space as well and so he told he told us that there's not a lot of space in space and like that had a nice little ring to it and like uh, that really just stuck in my head and like that was something that i was thinking about a lot while i was planning for this project you know and like again on earth versus space big difference you know like on earth you know like liquids sit in containers like when we do cell culture we can have everything open top and just feed the cells be you know we have to be sterile and everything but it's very you know you can train like an undergrad like anybody to do this within the day all the all these procedures very simple open top is the key for like doing for liquid sitting containers for tissue culture. But in space, you know, things you can't have open top experiments, liquids float away. So if like I were to have my tissues sitting in a 24 well, they would just float away with all the media in space. And that's a huge concern. And I think things take three times as long to do in space, just for, 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 for that reason and for many other reasons as well. And also another issue is like the time devoted to it. Oops. Let me move the pointer. There's a little bit of a delay on the pointer. So it, yeah, so the time devoted to experiments. So like on, you know, in the, in the lab setting, you know, like undergraduates and graduate students, you know, like they say like, oh, like graduate students, we have a lot of free time. We can always babysit if we need to do things a certain way. You know, like that's a jokey way of saying, but I'm always at the lab, like well, before the lockdown, I was always at the lab on standby. If I needed, to, if something like went crazy in the incubator and my cells were acting up, I could immediately fix the problem. Like from nine to five, I was always there to babysit the, the tissues or any cells that I was culturing. We don't really have those that that little that level of time on space. We have to book our crew time in advance. Like this is a 
you know, a multi, like a, a, a bunch of logistics and planning have to go into it. We have to fight for the time we get with the astronauts because astronauts, you know, arguably maybe they, I, I, I'd say they're more busy than graduate students. You know, I, me and Nate had a conversation about that, but you know, astronauts are like more busy than graduate students. They don't have time to babysit our one single experiment. And then another concern on Earth versus space is that sufficient resources are available in the lab setting. So we have like a microscope, we have all of our, our cell culture equipment. Everything is set up. Like the, when I came to the lab, everything is ready to do the science and like you know, plenty of space, you know, on the ground. But again, there's not a lot of space in space. We have limited equipment aboard the ISS uh, for the for these experiments. It's and essentially a lot of the stuff that we bring to run our experiments. We have to build, we have to build it ourselves and then send it up there. Yeah. Okay. So onto the next slide. And again, I'm sorry there is a little bit of a delay. So. It may take a little bit to, for things to go. Yeah. Okay. I think Nate, I'll have you control to move the slides. I think because the delay is a little bit to deal with. Yeah. So again, kind of going back to uh, like going back to like the platforms we had to design to run these experiments in space. One of the platforms is again Nate was talking about our engineered heart. Oh, I think you may have clicked ahead, uh, Nate. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oops. Okay, anyways, one of the things is that our engineered heart tissue platform, again, as Nate was talking about, we have our little tissue strips, which you can see in the upper left figure, you know, they're cast between two beam, two cantilever beams. One of them is rigid and the other one is flexible. And as the tissue strip uh, contracts, because it's a heart muscle, heart muscles contract, you know, they, they, they shorten, like the, the, the you know, flexible post bends and there's a little, and you can't really see it from this picture, but that, there's a little magnet embedded in the tip of the flexible post. So that motion of that flexible, the tip of that flexible coast causes uh, the magnetic field to change from some sensor a set distance away from the tissue. And we can relate that change to, a, 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 and that, that, that sensor that gets output as a voltage change. So you, as you can see from the figure on the right, the characterization, that voltage change can be correlated to a change in position of the, the tip of the flexible post. And again, you know, using classic beam theory, we can relate that change in position to a change, uh, to, a, to a, my, my amount of force being applied to the tip of that flexible post. And as you can see and on the bottom left figure, you can see like a 24 well is where we do a lot of our, that's like the, the primary housing for our tissue culture experiments with this engineered heart tissue platform that's on top, the 24 well. And then beneath it is our actual giant magneto resistive sensors. And so like that, that, that kind of like the primary uh, explanation for how that system works. And I think Nick, can we go to the next slide? And again, you know, like this was a design that I was actually like, uh, like a, how would I say it, it was tested for viability before it was like a proof of concept before I came into the lab and a lot of my work I've been here for like around around three years so a lot of my early work here was developing was in, and improving this magnetic sensing design and like my thing my my key was like building this reference canceling circuit so again we're test we're looking for magnetic field we're, we're looking for changes in magnetic field you know in our sensor and one of the problems is there's a lot of magnetic field changes happening that don't that aren't just you know coming from the tissue moving the little magnet in that flexible post you know there's a, there's this thing called emi electromagnetic interference and that's something that we had to deal with and that causes a dc offset in the output of our sensors and uh, and high frequency and also high frequency interference from just a lot of electronics and other things like muzzing around and messing up the reading and getting it so we can't get the right position reading from our uh, gmr sensor so what we had to do is we designed, I designed a, a printed circuit board with four sensing circuits and one reference circuit. We call it actually internally, we call it a 4-1 circuit. And so you can see the circuit layout on there. You know, you see like on the four quadrants, there's the four EHT, engineered heart tissue sensing circuits. And in the center is a reference circuit. And essentially it works as like a no noise canceling headphone. So you have your, on the, like you're on the, on the, on the right most, you have a noisy signal on a reference. This is just a theory. And then you, uh, the, you just you take the difference between those two and then you get your clean signal and that's the theory and uh, to how it works and then we designed we so we made this design we showed that we could get readings we could get good tissue readings from this and it's, it was viable so uh, can we go to the next slide please yeah so again that was all because that little that little uh, pcb is much smaller before we would have to do microscopy would have to take an image of the tissues we can't really we don't really have access to microscopy on space so we have that reference sensing circuit so we can measure the tissue the 
the forest development of the tissues in space. But now moving older, over to tissue culturing for the and the chamber design. So before, like I, you saw in the picture previously, there was a 24 well tissue culture dish. And that's what we normally work in. Again, that's open top. That's not going to fly in space. It's not going to work. Things are going to float everywhere. So we have to, so we had to redesign how we cultured our tissues for space. So we made some requirements. So one is that it had to be sealed because again, things will float in space. We don't want every anything floating in space. That'd be bad news. We also needed, it, it needed to be sealed, but it also needed to be gas permeable because the tissues still needed to, again, in the media, that the tissues were in, there still needed to be gas exchange in order for the media to remain viable to feed the tissues. And we also like, we needed it to contain a, a ne the necessary volume of media for cell culture. So then like those requirements led to some design choices. So what we had to do is we had to make an airtight design with injection ports. So again, we're not feeding it with like a little pipette over the top. We actually have two needles that and like uh, syringes that we go on uh, the left, uh, either side of the injection ports and the figure on the bottom left. And you have, it's kind of a push pull. You push in media or new media while you pull out old media. So it's an airtight design with injection ports. That's how we feed the tissues. And that was able to meet that requirement. And then as you can see from the picture on the bottom right, like, uh, there's that's actually a, a PDMS box, silicone bottom to allow for gas exchange. And you can actually see the tissues feeding uh, in, in the chamber as well. So like the PDMS bottom allowed for adequate gas exchange and allowed the, cha the chamber to still be sealed. And then also we needed the, the enclosure dimensions design. We allowed, we had had to design everything such that we could, that, that whole entire chamber when it was sealed could contain 30 milliliters of liquid. And that was like after a lot of discussions with multiple people on the science team, that seemed like a good amount to keep the tissues fed for the time windows that, that, we, that we required. So I think we go to the next slide, Nate. Okay, cool. So we had the chamber design. That's all good, well and good, you know. But then we needed to build all of, like the different ha housing apparatus for the circuit and the cha and the chamber design. Again, this is a magnetic sensing circuit. You know, everything needed to be sealed and secure. We didn't want to have the chamber be knocked, and then we, that would mess up all of our magnetic sensing readings for because we're because we're getting position measurements. And if you like, if like the movement. We, if you move the chamber and the, and the corresponding tissues with the, their little magnets, like, and it's not correspond because of some little mechanical disturbance to the system, like uh, that, that that's going to mess up our reading. So we need to have everything set in with these little uh, elastic fasteners, like the rubber, uh, essentially rubber bands on the bottom on the on the left right there. So the chambers are each. So each this is basically I call it a we call it a, they call it a plate habitat. But I call it like a lunchbox. That's what we were all calling it, like uh, during the engineering phase. So, in the lunchbox, we have it can hold four chambers with so that's six, twelve, eight. That's a so a twenty-four tissue, uh, twenty-four tissues, and, and again, every the, the chambers are set in, in in set in the little habitat, and then also inside that plate habitat is the magnetic sensing uh, uh, apparatus, as well as uh, circuitry for data acquisition and like temperature logging. So that's what the, everything was set. So, like, you know, four chambers and like, we were able to get the magnetic sensing readings and also it needed to be, and then what we, and then on the, on the, the picture on the right there is just a, an actual picture of somebody holding on to the, uh, play, uh, the, the chamber and circuitry housing, you know, and like, uh, like that, what they're holding on to is the circuitry and like, the, and like uh, by his hand is some venting. And this goes into like its own lunchbox and it has to be locked and sealed and airtight. So that design was all set and ready to go. And then could we go, uh, and then, uh, and then the final piece. So we had the plate habitat. We had this. We had the housing for the circuit, and the tissue design. So now uh, the the next portion that we needed to do is we needed to also. This is not something we designed. This is something that our collaborators are already designed. We need to have an incubator. So they call it the space automated bioproduct lab laboratory, and it's called uh, the short is Sable. So like there's here's a, the bottom right, bottom left is a, the front view of Sable. And the bottom right is the sable on the ISS. And so essentially what this does is this is a space incubator. It actually does a lot of other stuff. It, it's actually, and it's also the computer, the heart, so that, we, that, that communicates with, the, that we can, so we can, so when we get readings from our sensors and from this, any other sensors that may be inside of the enclosure of sable, those, those measurements can be taken and sent back down to Earth. So it's an incubator and are essentially the, and, and the computer that's taking the readings and do, and like sending them back to us on Earth. So. This is something that was just, yeah, okay, yeah, that's that's fine. Let me move to the next slide, Nate. So again, we had to we had so we had to design all of these things and then you know, make everything work so we could send this stuff to space. space. And then now what we're doing now is we're making a little milestone uh, timeline. So again, 
the start date for the project was September 2018. That was when like things got going. We started having some meetings and everything. And then like not like a lot of stuff happened, but it was very like a lot of meetings and talking validation tests, stress testing for space, like and prototyping all these different designs that I outlined previously, just ensuring that everything worked, all this stuff that we're designing works and like making sure that it meets all the requirements, running a bunch of prototypes and like going through all of that. That took place over the course of several months and that, those are little many deadlines in that time but then things really started picking up in july 2019 when we finalized and that's when we had a finalized chamber design and then we started we write we ran some tests in between did some little things and then october 2019 we actually needed to initiate tissue fabrication so we had around we were making around like almost 100 we needed around 100 tissues that was like the initial plan and that's a lot of cardiomyocytes so that whole process is took a lot of time we needed it up to like a preset it up several months in advance of the launch and then in december 2019 the hardware design was finalized after a lot of like hard work and a lot of like little issues we ran into we finally finally reached a finalized hardware design and then once we had everything set up we had all this stuff like okay so we could send it to space right then and there and like, but we don't want to send it to space without running doing a trial run like we need you don't want to do anything like that's going into space unless you you like you were do a trial run basically so that's what the EVT or experimental validation test and that took place on January 2020 so we read that and that ran for around a month you know and then we're cutting it pretty close you know the launch is like right there you know and then uh, February 2020 we had to work they were shipping everything so that's something that I'm going to talk about it turns out shipping like really sensitive heart tissues you know across the country is a big issue it's it's definitely something you have to worry about it's it became it's like we knew it was a concern but it became a, a gigantic concern around February 2020 again one month before the launch we're like this is this big issue popped up you know and then March 2020 the beginning is the launch you know so a lot of these big deadlines started happening and like every month there was something new ish some like, before the launch just things were going wrong and it's like things didn't come together until like the final like the last couple the last minute so you know like a very, very incredibly stressful you know like i wasn't expecting it people told me like in september 2018 i talked to other people who had done these types of experiments and they're like it's gonna get really busy when they dig up to launch and i was like okay like i i, I understand that you don't really know until you're in it and I'm just so, it, and it was incredibly busy and stressful and hectic. So yeah, kind of going to the next slide, please. So again, let's talk about the experimental validation test. So again, at that point, we had a chamber, we had our chamber design, we had our circuits, like hardware and all of our hardware finalized. So like, uh, we, so we, what we needed to do is we needed to culture those tissues in the chamber design, you know? And so we were able to do that. We were able to get on the, on the, on the right is that we were able to be a force readings with a magnetic sensor, all of that was good. And then on the bottom right, we were able to do histology. So to look at the protein structure of, the, of, these, of these tissues, and we were able to freeze the tissues for RNA preservation. So these are the big things that we need. We need to get readings and we need to make sure that the like all these processes that we do on the ground to like assess the function and like a performance and like to a measure to, to, to like, a, like a characterize the tissues, we could still do those in space. We, well, we could still do those with, this, with that platform, yeah. And that's it. So we were, that was it was a success. That was all. That all seemed to work out. Okay. So now this is the big doozy that I was uh, talking to you about. So again, it, around you know in uh, in you know like uh, that, that that month leading up to launch, we needed to wor do like worry about shipping. And this was around Jan uh, around January that this we started thinking doing some trial runs to how we were going to actually ship all of our tissues to uh, from like the University of Washington to like where the to Kennedy Space Center. In Florida, in uh, Central Florida, so that was a big concern. We talked about it. We like had prepped some stuff, and, but we needed to actually do a test. We hadn't really done a test, and that was kind of because of short deadlines. A lot of stuff wasn't finalized till near the end, so we kind of had to wait to the end to do the shipping test. So we were able to. We so we did. We loaded some chambers with viable and beating engineered heart tissues, and we shipped them from Seattle, Washington, to Boulder, Colorado, to Bioserve. So that was like the hardware implementation group that we were working with. And so. We shipped it through FedEx overnight shipping. And we, so what we did is from this little flow figure right here, we like had their chambers, we encased them in foam, and we locked them in our little lunch box. And then, and then we kept them like with phase change packs at 37 degrees Celsius, like the optimum temperature for them to live. And then as you can see, pre-ship, you know, the tissues look pretty good. And like post-ship, the tissues also look pretty good. They remained attached to the post. We were worried that they'd fall off. It didn't seem like they fall, fell off and they were viable. They were kind of, they were beating before, like pre-shipping and they were beating post-shipping. 
But after about a week in Boulder, they just stopped feeding. And that was a huge issue, you know, like that's a big issue. Like all of them failed. So the shipping test, like something happened. Like, I don't know if like the FedEx people like dropped off the kick the pack, kick the box or something like that. We have no idea what happened, but something happened to the tissues while they were shipping that caused them to eventually stop feeding when they were in Colorado. Major issue, right? We're sending, we've made like built like around a close to a billion cardiomyocytes to make these tissues, you know, that's a very labor intensive process. We did so much prep work and like at the final minute, we're not going to be able to ship the tissues, you know, to Florida, huge issue. So we had to figure out a plan for that. So we could go to the next slide, please, Dave. So again, so in a, in a meeting where everyone was kind of freaking out, you know, I was like a little nervous, like I was hopeful, but nervous, you know, and, and I think, I, I think it was Nate that brought on the idea. I was like, why don't we do carry on luggage? Like we're, we're flying out there anyways. Why don't we have people and carry these tissues over, over to, from Colorado to Florida. And so, uh, I mean, we, that it was that, you know, that, that seemed like a viable idea. You know, we were short on time. We were already flying, you know, Again, there's a lot of considerations. This is not something that you could anybody could do. You can't just like make have his biological samples like the day before your flight without telling TSA and then bring them on. I hope to bring them onto the plane. So it was. I think so. Nate, we'd have to click a little because like uh, this the, the flow chart. So again, we so what we had to do is we had to make the tissues. We put them in these little lunch boxes. We sealed them with CO2, and then what we had we enc we encased the little lunch boxes with the tissues with face change packs that kept them at 37 degrees Celsius and then and some styrofoam and a little cardboard box and we set everything and then and, and that, that's that box you see right there we put a little sticker on it with the the cases so the, the the funding source like they have a little chips in space symposium and so like they had some stickers from that event so we put some stickers on the event you know and then we had some little handles to be carried and everything was taped up and set and ready to go and then uh one more uh, and then also like a little, we had to get it. So our implementation partner actually had done, had shipped, had done carry on, like a, a biological experiments as carry on luggage before. So they gave us a little hand carry note, a lot of serious language. Like this is going to be on the SpaceX 20 launch. This is going to Kennedy Space Center. It's very official, like to get through to TSA, you know. So, and it ended up working out, you know, like, so it was some, someone else in me. So someone else did the, like, uh, took tissues up, took the first half of the tissues up initially. And they went, they went to TSA fine. And then the next time was me. And like, I was going around the end of February and like, you know, like a little, like, a little story time. Like this is when like the COVID-19 issue was popping up, you know, and, and, like, and Seattle was like starting to be the American scene, being seen as the American center of it. So like, I'm getting picked up from UW Medicine with this box with full biohazardous material, interesting conversation with my Lyft driver, you know, a little bit of weird stuff there. And then when I actually went to the airport, the person that handled, that's our TSA handler, for some reason didn't show up, he wasn't there. So I was just sitting like in front of the security checkpoint with a box, just like looking very suspicious. So that was very strange, you know, luckily everything worked out. A lot of the people at TSA remember the person who came before me. Some of them even had that little uh, tissue chips and space sticker like on their bat, on their like walkie talkies. So they remembered the past previous person. So they were able to carry me through without any issue, but it was definitely scary. It was, I definitely did not know what was going to happen, but and, and it, everything ended up working out prior to the flight. Okay, so cool. So we actually were able to ship the tissues, all the tissues that we sent were viable in feeding, you know, and then what we were actually at Kennedy Space Center, it's crunch time. We have like a few weeks before like, you know, this is, this is like late February. So we have to prep the tissues, you know, we have to keep feeding them at Florida. And like, oh, and again, at Kennedy Space Center, like uh, look at these pictures, like the upper left one is the one you see in Kennedy, the vehicle assembly building. It's gigantic, even bigger in person if you've ever go there. But, and then below it is like a little bit less glamorous, the space station processing facility. That's where our, that's where we were doing our work. And then the on-site team from left to right is Jonathan Sweet and Johns Hopkins. And then uh, like me on like uh, the middle, le uh, middle uh, and the middle left is me. And then uh, on the right, middle, middle right is uh, Paul Koenig and Stephanie Countryman. They're the people at BioServe. So they're on the implementation team. So we are like a skeleton crew trying to get to make sure this, these tissues get, got sent to space. So again, this little flow chart on the left though, we had, the, again, when we were at Kennedy Space Center, the tissues were beating. We still needed to prep the tissues and keep them fed and happy. We didn't want them to get contaminated or anything before the launch, that would be a big issue. And then what we have to do is we have to integrate the tissues hardware and then run some baseline tests before we actually do hand over to, like, to, the, to the people working at Kennedy Space Center so they could, they could set everything up for launch. So, and then click, can we click on the data? And, but there was, a, again, 
we kind of like again we were on a short timetable we ran into an issue during the integration procedure so what ended up happening was the tissues were beating we entered we like loaded them we loaded them into the chambers they were still beating we did a bunch of like sterilization routines we loaded the chambers into the little lunch box we we sealed everything up and then when we went to take a reading for some reason we weren't getting we were getting like flat lines so like that was a big issue so like uh, we're at that at that so go to the next slide please I think. Again, so like we aren't getting reading. So what's happening? Like this is a very big concern for us. So this was a very big concern. So we, our potential problems were the tissues still beating? Did something happen to them that would cause them to stop beating during the loading process? So attempted solution: we removed and inspected the tissues, and I guess the tissues were still viable and beating. So the, like that wasn't the issue. Okay. So were the circuits not working, you know, like maybe like we had a bad board or something may have happened. So we had some spare circuit boards lying around. Those were all good. And then we also ran some little calibration tests with some equipment that we had on hand. And the circuits were as fun were functional. They, they seem to be doing operating fine. This is very concerning, you know, like if the tissues aren't bad, it's not the circuits, what could it be, you know, like so again, like we were at this point, we had done these things. This is not all these all these little troubleshooting steps. These took a long time to do like it was very stressful. So at that point, we well, like, what about the strength of the magnets? Maybe that could be an issue. So we had to, what we did is we increased the distance between the magnets and the giant magnetoresistive sensors, and that seemed to do it. So something was over. I guess that there was something with that particular setup where those magnets were overloading the sensors that we had never seen before. But just increasing the distance between the magnets and the UMR sensors seemed to fix that. So we were able to get uh, successful sensor readings. We go to the next slide, Nate. So again. We finally figured this out at 8 p.m. March 4th. We solved the problems observed. Here we go and uh, click it. So we figured out the troubleshooting at 3 a.m. on March 5th. So like very late, very late night. So next slide, next slide. Again, we had to hand over at 8 a.m. on March 5th. So like we, there, we actually did go back to our apartments and slept for a little bit. I almost overslept, but we were able to do final handover and we did some baseline reading tests. Okay, next. And then at 11 p.m. on March 6, you know, we had those tissues ready for the launch. So as you can see, like here's the actual launch happening. You know, like this is uh, the sounds not on. It's very, it was very loud. This is my first ever like rocket launch. Definitely an experience. And, and like uh, Paul Koenig, while he was filming, said, "Hang on, little heart cells," because yeah, like that. So there's a nice little thing. And so next slide. Nate. So the tissues are on board the ISS. So this is Jessica Mir, the, the scientist who was uh, handling our tissues at the time. So she had the little pee hat. They were taking the camera, and like there's their little the sterile environment. Well, and she you can see with the in the picture on the right, she's actually feeding the tissues. And in like the interest of time, I probably go to the next slide. Okay, so the results from the International Space Station. So on the top left is the baseline reading at Kennedy Space Center. Bottom left is the in-orbit reading on the International Space Station. Definitely some differences. There were some noise issues. That was the whole concern. Interest of time, I, I could go into that, but just I would probably want to talk about that. But then taking a look at the, from the day minus two is the baseline and day 39 is was the final reading. So I, we can see, we see a drop in twitch force because of the, so that is something that we are actually, we did actually notice. And, you know, and then uh, one key thing about the five, day 39 reading, we were actually able to get tissues like, to land back, land, land onto earth, and we were still able to culture them. So R plus nine is always return, nine days after returning. So, and we, so, but even after returning to, to earth, they, that drop is in uh, Twitch Forest is still happening. So I just enter time, go to the next slide. So we still have work left to do. We were supposed to do a ground control. It was supposed to be like rough, like a, kind of in phase, like at the, around the same time, but uh, and with the same feeding timelines and same hardware or space flight issues, just to make sure that you know we, we can do compare. We could compare the two, and like we've had some, we've had, we've done several attempts since launch, but due to COVID nineteen and the lockdown, a lot of difficulties arose. We're like short on manpower and time. We're still figuring it out. There's been a lot of contamination, so like it's it's definitely an issue, but we're figuring it out. And then histology. We still need to do histology on the tissues, so we have the set of space flight tissues, and we have everything set up to do histology. And we've we've we've, we've done a couple shots of it, uh, took a couple shots of it. Things are still not working out, but we want to do histology to examine the sarcoma structure to like uh, see if they can it conforms with our force readings. And then the final piece is RNA sequencing. You know, so we need the and so the set of space flight tissues are like they are frozen for later processing. All that stuff's ready, and that's being handled at John. I think uh, by the Johns Hopkins crew. So, and then we need to do RNA sequencing for transcriptome analysis to look for changes in cardiac health beyond just like the change in functional performance that we're seeing. So just to look for 
a little deeper into the actual cells inside of the tissues. Okay, next slide. Hey, I think it's your slide. Your yeah. turn now. Okay. Thanks, Ty. Um, yeah, so I mean, as Ty kind of pointed out, um, it maybe might be easier to do science in space at this moment in time than it is to do science on Earth. And that's mostly due to uh, this little guy right here, the, uh, uh, the corona, SARS coronavirus, um, which is causing COVID-19. I wanted to just kind of close out with a story though about how the technology that Ty helped put together for the space study is now being used today to study the uh, COVID-19's effect on the heart. So as you guys may have read a lot about, you have worse outcomes if you have a pre-existing condition. Things like um, diabetes or obesity can often increase your chances of having um, um, uh, worse outcomes from being infected. Now there's been more recent reports about the virus being able to cause cardiac injury. And so these are um, a number of studies. And the question is, is can the virus actually, how does it affect the heart? So there's some different mechanisms that have been thought about. You know, when you get infected, there's this intense uh, inflammation storm that occurs. So could the heart be getting damaged as sort of like an innocent bystander as the virus affects your blood vessels, affects your lungs? Could that be a problem that just the heart is, is experiencing this inflammation and gets damaged from it? The other thought is that, well, there's been a lot of damage to the blood vessels that can cause clots. So could that be causing damage, almost like, like you get with a heart attack? Could these be causing problems for the heart? But the other thought is, could there be direct infection by this virus into heart tissue? And that's actually what the study that um, uh, colleagues here at the University of Washington, we've been doing together. So this is a study with Chuck Murray and Michael Gale here at uh, UW. So just a little background for everybody. Um, our cells have um, proteins on their surface and the, corona, the SARS virus is able to bind to some of these proteins. And this, it does so through what's called a spike protein on its outer surface. And once that happens, it's able to deliver its uh, RNA into the cell and then hijack the cell's machinery to start replicating the whole virus itself. But the protein that it binds to is the ACE2 receptor. And you, this protein is, is found on cells of our lungs, our blood vessels, and our hearts. Um, so there's a likelihood that this virus is able to infect the heart tissue. Now to do this kind of work, the, U, the UW has a biosafety level three system, and you pretty much have to dress up like an astronaut to go into this room. Um, there's a high precautions about working with this virus, and so, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of personal protection and a lot of um, um, barriers that have to occur to be able to do this kind of work. And so this is uh, Sylvia Marciano, who's a postdoc in Chuck Murray's lab, who is the, the person that went into the, the, the Biosafety Level 3 facility to do these experiments. Um, so what Sylvia has been able to see is that there is an effect on these cardiomyocytes that we make from stem cells. So these cells can become infected. On the left here, you see the normal cells and you can see all of their structure on the inside, but shown in here in purple is a marker for the virus. So you're actually seeing these cells becoming infected by the virus. And what happens once these cells become infected, they stop beating over time and they eventually will detach. So these will, they will eventually will die. Now, how does that affect the performance, the, 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 the strength of these tissues, of these, of these uh, heart tissues? Well, what Ty did was he engineered a standalone system that used that magnetic technology that Sylvia could take into the BSL-3. So now we can do experiments remotely. All of these little tissues that are in here are beating, and Ty is able to acquire data over time to what's happening with these tissues. So half of them were given no virus. This is the control, while the other half were infected with the virus. And what we see is that after about two days, these tissues start to get weaker and weaker 
and have less force generation. So we're seeing a direct infection and a direct impact on the cardiac function due to this virus. So I just want to kind of close things out for everybody here. What we've talked to you guys about are these engineered heart tissues that we make from um, human stem cells. And these are a great model for looking at diseases in a dish or even maybe finding ways to improve cardiac therapies, screening for different drug compounds, or understanding the nature of a disease itself. Um, they also have a use for space. You know, as we try to figure out ways to improve uh, human health in space, these engineered heart tissues can maybe provide that bridge and data that we need. Um, it's not that easy to send something up to space. Uh, it's an endor uh, enormous endeavor, but you know, we've been able to use multiple expertises from across the country here. Of course, it does take a lot of time and some grit, as Ty alluded to, with uh, being able to kind of push through any kind of obstacles that are in the way. But we've been able to do a successful demonstration of these tissues up to space and return. And these results we're getting now are very uh, interesting. We are seeing that decreased uh, cardiac performance, perhaps similar to the cardiac atrophy that, that astronauts experience up in space. And then also th this has an earth benefit. So that same kind of technology can be used in a very controlled environment like a biosafety level three room. So we were able to repurpose that technology here for this study. And we'd be able to find that these engineered heart tissues can become infected and have a decreased cardiac function as a result. So to kind of wrap things up, um, I'd like to acknowledge folks from my own lab. You know, Ty has been great th through this whole process, plus also uh, Kevin and Andrea and Samantha, who showed you, I showed you the data that she has with David Mack on the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And of course, from Chuck's lab with Sylvia and the COVID-19 project. Um, also, this work is, is being led by Dukko Kim at Johns Hopkins and Jonathan Sui has been a tremendous um, uh, uh, lead as well on that space project. And then of course, you can't get anything to space without the help of Biosurf. They're probably the world's best at packaging and shipping things up to space. And so uh, Stephanie Countryman is the director of the Biosurf Space Technologies at the uh, University of Colorado. And then also uh, Peter Lee is a cardiologist uh, who's also been involved in the space project. So uh, before we close out for questions, I just wanted to highlight the upcoming talks that we have here for the symposium. Uh, next week, Travis will, uh, Lange will give a talk about a very interesting camera for space. And then we also have talks following on um, from uh, Blue Origin and then also from NASA as, uh, as well. So if you guys are interested in these topics, I recommend you guys come back. But now uh, I'll go ahead and uh, stop here and. Uh, I welcome any questions you guys may have. I did see there was some in the chat, but if you want to un, uh, unmute yourself, go right ahead. So I see a raised hand from uh, Adathan. You want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you hear me properly? Yes. Right? Great. Um, super talk. Thank you for this um, comprehensive view of your entire experiment. So in vivo, I understand that cardiomyocytes work against gravity to pump the blood, and they probably need to adapt to the uh, to the load against the gravity. And you know, if you have if you have humans in space, um, the hemodynamics are changed, and so the cardiomyocytes you know adapt to the new environment. I was just curious, like what were like hypothesis or something? Um, you do see a really significant drop in twitch force just on a single cell level without any flow dynamics. So I was just curious uh, what you think or what do you think that really contributes to, um, to this uh, reduction of force without any flow, without any, um, on a single, because um, yeah, I can't, I, can't, I can't imagine inner um, gravity actually having an effect on a uh, single cell dynamics. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I think it's it is interesting to think about, you know, at the level at the small level of a cell, really does it uh, does it even know what gravity is? Um, yeah. You know, a lot of this is d done to the sort of the the hemodynamic loads that are on the tissue itself. But you know, there are 
other effects that could be happening up in space too. Um, you know, it, by, by putting this experiment, I think it's something like 200 miles from Earth, you are a little bit further away from that protective, um, the protective environment from space radiation. So that mm -hmm. could be causing problems that maybe will age these tissues as well. Um, so that there is this sort of accelerated aging that occurs up in space with a lot of uh, uh, damage to the cells. That could be uh, an effect here. We don't really know until we start to look more into some of the RNA data that we have. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm doubtful of the effect of microgravity directly on cells, but I'm not going to rule it out. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. That's yeah. a really good question. That's, that's really interesting. I think the, uh, if, if we, once we have the transcriptomics and all the, uh, the RNA data, I think it'll be really interesting to, to hear from you more. Thank you. Thanks. So there was a question in the chat about the bubbles happening, um, to prevent bubbles from happening. I think, um, is this, I think maybe referring to either making the tissues, to, we, we, I mean, when we're making the, the 100 tissues that had to go up to space, we try to make sure that there was high quality control in that. Um, but I think maybe you saw those bubbles that were from the shipping test, and that is a concern. Um, so I think we did see bubbles in those chambers that occurred when we tried to ship it through, you know, a courier, I think, um, it, I guess the, 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 the moral to the story is um, if you want something done, you got to do it yourself and put it on a plane yourself to get it there to not have that problem. Let's see, there was another question here. Um, I think Pat Steele asked a question for us. Um, what do you wish you would have time to do in those last two months before the launch? Uh, I'll, I'll let Ty answer that question since I think he suffered through that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, do you want to see the list? Well, I'm just kidding. But the kid, there was, there's a lot of stuff that we wanted to do. So, I mean, hindsight's 2020, you know, so like, but I think the big thing is just we had the one EVT and like one thing that we had, uh, Stephanie from Biosur told us is that sometimes people will run multiple EVTs just to like make sure that this that their system really works because like you may get like the EVT may be the lucky shot and like the, it was a lucky shot because we didn't see that issue with the sensors during the EVT so it would be nice to just have like run a run to just run another EVT and also to uh I mean it's to probably like that circuit what well, that 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 pro that circuit was loosely based off of my initial reference canceling design there were subtle changes that were made to it you know, and it was kind of just because we were approaching like the launch timeline and like I was talking with the electrical engineer at BioSur and we were just like, we didn't have time to run the proper characterization test to ensure that like all of the tech, that all of like the things that I showed that worked with my design would work with the space design. So if we had more time, we probably would have been able to run, run some more characterization tests, really stress tested the circuit. And like, that's kind of something that we're working with. There's a second launch that we're working on. So we're hopefully, we're, we're like in this, in the phase that, like, you know, again, it's like lockdown. So like, or it gets, it's a little bit harder to go into the lab for like every, but for like in Colorado and here. So, but we are trying to make time to actually run some more stress tests on this, on that sort of design. And we are gonna make some light modifications to it, I think just based on an early impressions. But big thing is like a second EVT, you know, do that again. And then the, the, the second thing is just to stress test that circuit 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 design. So um, there was a question, um, how does this system compare, or do we do electrical stimulation and how does this system compare to the work done out of Columbia that's been spun out to Tara? Um, so yeah, with, the, with these engineered heart tissues, uh, there's been a lot of work about exercising them. And there was a great paper, I think it was maybe two or three years ago, uh, Nature about electrical stimulation to help uh, um, do some more high intensity training of these tissues. And these cells will spontaneously contract as you saw in that video that I shared, um, but you can also electrically pace them too. Um, you know, we've done a lot with trying to do long-term electrical pacing in our hands and it's not been easy. Um, I know um, our system is very similar to, I'd say, what um, Gordana has done at Columbia 
Hers are a little bit, I think, maybe dimensionally a little shorter, um, but I know they've been done to try to do a lot with different pacing frequencies. In our hands, we haven't really seen any major benefit from that. Um, the, and the other part, I think, um, you know, but I think ours are able to be electrically paced as well. Um, the other question was um, next steps from Alan. As um, we have a second mission to launch again, this time that we've been successful, we're going to be now sending up an uh, additional experiment in two years. So this is, it's good that we get a second go at this as well. Um, Sam, you had your hand raised. Do you want to uh, ask your question? Uh, yeah, so um, you guys commented briefly on um, uh, basically having to make sure the, uh, you weren't taking up too much of the astronauts' time with all the other things they're busy with. So uh, when you're designing this whole experimental setup to then be handed off to astronauts, can you talk a little bit more about um, how much the astronauts are able to do, how self-contained does everything need to be, if something goes wrong, how do you troubleshoot, do you like get on a Zoom call with them from the space station and walk them through it? Like, how's that? Yeah, so um, we kind of only had about uh, one, I can't remember ties, but sort of like one, one session per week, because there's multiple experiments, multiple things that are going on up in the space station. And it's not, it, things are slower. I mean, it's sort of like trying to do science underwater. You know, you, you can't move as fast. You can't just go walk over and go grab something. You have to be very thoughtful about what you're doing. And so um, we had to uh, really take off a lot of demands on the, the astronauts. Um, so we kind of only had a set regimen of what we actually were asking them to do. So we had to kind of get that um, protocol in place very early on because there's a lot of, of scripted time for the astronauts up there. Um, luckily we did not, I mean, I don't know if Ty didn't really mention this, but we started getting live telemetry back. And the moment we started seeing real heartbeats up in space, that was fantastic. I mean, there was noise that we saw that was unexpected, but I, you know, the, we, we, there was no way for us to test what was up in the space station, but we were getting good enough data. Um, so luckily we didn't really have to ask them to go fix anything for us. Um, I don't know how that would even be I, because of the, the delay and the um, in communication. It's not like we have a direct phone call with them or anything like that, but um, hopefully we don't encounter anything that significant that needs that kind of um, uh, maintenance work on our next mission. Hi, this, this is Per. Um, it's going to great talk, Nate and Ty. It's amazing, amazing stuff. I just have a little question about you know the self-beating oscillators. Like each, if you put a, a um, mechanical clock or a bunch of mechanical clocks on a flexible wall. They all synchronize. Did you see any uh, synchronization of the of the different oscillators that you put? You put them everything on one uh, kind of plate. So you know what we have is we've got these cells that are in a three dimensional tissue, and they do start. I mean, even they are contracting even before we put them into that three dimensional environment, but you have to get them to coordinate together. And I know Ty can talk a lot about this. Sometimes it doesn't work, but you still see little twitches in all the different cells within that three-dimensional environment. But there's sort of two things that have to happen. One is you have to get the tissue, the cells to get kind of closer together so that they can form connections and become uh, it's in synchronized with each other. Um, but I'm not gonna rule out the fact that there could be um, kind of transmission through a material. This has been seen in the dish with individual cardiomyocytes. If you have them next to each other, they'll start to synchronize their beats, which is rather interesting when you have a single cell. We're trying to push this more towards many cells coming together as a tissue. A good question. Um, there's another question from Marita who's asking about uh, fluorescent calcium probes. We've actually done this with, um, uh, we have that with G-Camp, we've also done it with uh, Fluo4, and we also now can do it with Fura2. So we're able to monitor calcium transients um, within these tissues, and we've, we've published on that in, you know, 
while it's been sort of synchronized with these contractions. And then I think, um, I think it's, if there's no other questions, I don't think there's any other questions that I'm missing right now. Um, but I guess we'll just, we'll end it here and uh, thanks everybody for attending and then um, come back next week for our next talk.